Hello. How was everybody this morning? It was pretty awesome when Matt Mansfield danced up onto the stage. <laughs> I was back there and I was like, my guy. <clears throat> my name's Matthew Thornton. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> Sorry. Talk about an identity crisis, right? <clears throat> Has anybody here ever gone through an identity crisis? Anybody willing to admit it, that they've gone through one? I personally have gone through one. When I was like 12, 13 years old, I was really into a bunch of different styles of music. Like I loved heavy metal, like Metallica, Megadeth, you know, those guys were, were my boys. And so I was going through this, this season where I would try to emulate them. I'd try to dress like them. I wanted to grow my hair out long like them. But some of my other friends really liked rap, like... Um, I don't know if anybody remember Bone, Bone Thugs and Harmony. I mean, that was the, so one of my buddies. Listen, and so I had like this identity crisis where I couldn't decide who I was going to be. Am I going to be like Bone or am I going to be like James Hetfield and Metallica? There's actually a picture. That's me on the left, like just trying to figure out my life. Like what the heck is going on there? I'm wearing sweatpants, a hat, sideways, some sunglasses. I'm pretty sure I was also wearing combat boots with that, that you can't see. But I also still go through a little bit of an identity crisis here now because as many of you know, my name is Bailey, but that's not my first name, it's my last name, right? So with all the, the Stevens and Steves up here, when I moved up here from Texas, Bailey seemed to be the easiest way for people to identify me. But of all the people who call me Bailey, can you guess who never calls me Bailey? My wife, good guess, but she does from time to time, especially if she's talking to one of you about me, which probably happens more than I know. But she calls me Bailey sometimes. The, the people who never call me Bailey are my parents. And why? Why do my parents never call me that? Because that's not the name that they gave me. <laughs> you know, that as my parents, they had the right, because they loved me and they cared for me and they want what's best for me, they had the right to choose how I would be identified, right? And everybody here has a name. If you have a name, raise your hand, right? Yeah, all of us, right? Did you know that names also have meanings? Does anybody in here know what your name means? A few of us? Yeah, last night in, 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 the, in the service last night, I asked that question, and almost every hand, they're like, I know what it means. You're not telling me anything, buddy, but... Anyway, my name means crowned one, uh, so go figure that. But it, it's interesting to me that names, even in, in this American culture that we live in, have um, meanings that I think and I believe that to this day God holds a sovereignty over in our names, right? Like take, for instance, my son, his name is Jack. And my wife had, from the time we got married, she had always said, if we have a son, his name's going to be Jack, you don't have a choice. <laughs> and I did what any self-respecting leader of his household would do, and I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's cool with me, okay? But what we didn't know is that God, in laying the name Jack on Tracy's heart, was revealing himself to us in a way that we couldn't see at the time. So you're thinking, that's a pretty cool story. My son's name, Jack, it comes from the name Jacob, not Jacob, Jacob means deceiver. It comes from John, which means God is gracious. And what you don't know is that we almost lost Jack two times during Tracy's pregnancy. Two times he was almost born so prematurely that he probably would have died, and if he didn't, he was going to have serious medical conditions his entire life. But God was gracious to us. And Jack was born past his due date at almost nine pounds. And he can live in that now because he knows it to be true. And we know it to be true. Tracy can proclaim and I can proclaim and Jack can proclaim that God is gracious. And we may or may not realize this, but what we believe about ourselves shapes how we live. Every single one of us, when you were born, God had a plan for your life. And that plan was stolen by the sin nature that we're born into. Your identity was stolen by sin. But the good news this morning is that Jesus stands ready, willing, and able to restore your identity 
And I think that this story that we see uh, in Genesis chapter 32 about Jacob uh, is going to illustrate that for us. So if you've got your Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to start in verse 28. Sorry, I've got a little bit of stuff going on. Verse 28, Genesis 32. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. And therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. And that leads me to our takeaway this morning. And if you want to write this down, I'll say it twice. Life change begins with identity change. Life change begins with identity change. Last week, Pastor Matt introduced us to Jacob by talking a little bit about his dysfunctional family. And what I love about these Old Testament characters and these Old Testament stories, all of these stories that we read in the Old Testament, they're not isolated events. They're all working together to tell one great story And they all point to the one main character who's Jesus Christ. It's kind of like when you look through a photo album of a wedding. All of these pictures are single pictures that happened within one large event. Nobody looks at a photo album of a wedding and says, man, they got super dressed up just to feed cake to each other. No, you'd look at the photo album of the wedding and you would say, okay, This was after a wedding, and there'd been a ceremony, and now they're celebrating, and they're doing the traditional thing where they feed cake to one another. So every picture that you see is a smaller picture that happens within one larger picture. And that's the way it is with these Old Testament stories. When we come to these stories of Adam or Abraham or Isaac, we can see that 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 character is just a shadow to which Jesus Christ is the light, okay? Okay? And we're going to look today that not only is Jesus the true and better Adam or Moses or Isaac or Abraham, but he's also the true and better Jacob as well. And that's what we're going to look at. All of these stories point to one larger story. So before we can go into it, I need to give a little bit of a refresher from last week just so we know where we are in this picture. Otherwise, it's going to be like walking into a movie 15 minutes late. Or walking into church after the music starts. So, I'm sorry. That was a dig. I'm sorry. (laughs) I take it back. (laughs) That one guy was like, not funny. So if you remember, Jacob was a twin. And he had a brother, his name was Esau. And if you recall, even in the womb, Jacob and Esau were fighting with one another over who was going to be born first. They were struggling And Esau was born first, and he came out covered in red hair, and so his parents named him Esau, which means hairy. So Esau's parents saw something that was externally true about him, and they gave him a name that was consistent with his identity. And that was something that that Esau couldn't really change because it was a physical thing, and it was fitting for him to be named Harry, right? Right? But remember, Jacob was born second, and he came out holding on to Esau's heel, and so his parents named him Jacob, which means heel grabber. But in that context, in that day, the name heel grabber carried this connotation of someone who was a deceiver, someone who would uh, use other people for their own selfish gain and their own selfish interest. So Jacob, in the very beginning of his life, comes out holding on to his brother's heel, His parents give him a name that corresponds with his identity, right? And guess what? Jacob spent a large portion of his life living up to that identity. But it didn't have to be that way for Jacob. Because Jacob's name was based on something that had to do with the internal rather than the external. 
Jacob's life could change, but it didn't because Jacob spent so much of his life actually believing that he was a deceiver that it probably got hard for him to be anything other than a deceiver. Remember what I said earlier when I was telling the story of my son's name? What we believe about ourselves shapes the way that we live. So Jacob had lived up to his name for so long that he began to find his identity in that name, and that name was Deceiver. But God had different plans to change Jacob's life. It had to start, though, with identity change, because identity change is what begins life change. If we go back and read the story of Jacob and Esau again, and I'm going to paraphrase for time, but uh, we remember that Jacob grew up to be like this mighty hunter dude, and J- or Esau did, and then Jacob grew up and he was like a homebody, a tent dweller, is what the, the Bible says. And this one day, Esau's out hunting, and he comes in, he sees his brother in there cooking some stew, and he says, dude, I'm dying of starvation, give me something to eat. And Jacob, in that moment, could have been a good brother and said, oh yeah, come on in, brother, sit down, let's, let's talk about the hunt. Let's talk about the girls we have crushes on. Let's talk about how our parents get on our nerves. Or if you wanted to sit here and vent to me about how hard it is to be so hairy, come on, man. You know, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about life. You know, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to find his identity in his name. He chose to find his identity in the name Deceiver. And so he says, okay, I'll give you some food, but first you have to sell me your birthright. So he essentially steals his birthright from his brother. And pretty much what that meant was that Jacob was going to get all of the inheritance. And just for the record, their dad, Isaac, was not a poor man. So Jacob was set to benefit greatly from this. And later on, we would see that Jacob continued to find his identity in his name. And he conspires with his own mother on how now he can go in and steal the family blessing from his brother. And we don't have time really to get into what all of that means you should go back and watch Pastor Matt's sermon last week if you didn't. Next week, uh, Jim Harrell's going to kind of finish this three-part thing out. But um, we get to this point where Isaac, Jacob and Esau's father, feels like he's getting to the end of his life, okay? And he's ready to pass his family blessing on to his oldest son. So he, he calls his son Esau and says, go out, kill me some wild game, come back, cook me something delicious because daddy likes to eat, and then I'm going to pass the blessing, the family blessing on to the oldest son. But do you remember what happened? While he's out hunting, Jacob gets with his mom, and they decide that they're going to go in there and trick Esau, or trick Isaac, and steal Esau's blessing. Okay? So Jacob's mom says, you should go out, kill a goat, cook it, bring it back, pretend to be your brother, and steal the blessing from him. So Jacob thinks, this is a good idea. But then Jacob gets a little bit scared, right? He's going to notice that I'm not my brother because I have smooth skin. My brother has hairy skin. So what does he say to his mom? He's going to know that I'm lying, right? So she says, no, don't worry about that. Your dad's got failing eyesight. Just throw that goat skin on you and then go pretend to be your brother. Which, by the way, how hairy was Esau? (laughs) Like... I know some hairy dudes, but none of them are like a goat. I mean, that's like kind of gross. So that's exactly what happens. Either way, Jacob poses as his brother, steals his brother's blessing after already have stolen his birthright. And talk about like sibling rivalry. Talk about wanting to kick your sibling in the face. You know, like, last time I preached, by the way, I said I wanted to kick my sister in the face. I was joking about that. I left that totally open-ended, and people were coming up to me being like, man, you're violent. That's not funny. I'm sorry about that. I just need to address that real quick and say I don't really want to do that to my sister. But I'm sure that Jacob thought that Esau was going to do that to him. Because he, what, what happens? After he finds out that his dad and his brother know about the deception... He tucks tail and gets out of town. Why? Because he's afraid that his brother's going to kill him. He literally thought that Esau was going to kill him. So he flees, he gets married, he acquires many possessions, and he's just out there deceiving people left and right, you know, living his best life now. And then one day after 20 years, 
he decides, I'm going to go home. I haven't seen my family. Surely my brother's forgiven me by now. I'm going to go home. So he packs his family and his possessions up, and he starts heading home. Well, somewhere along the way, Esau finds out that Jacob's coming home. So as he's traveling home, Jacob gets word, hey, dude, your brother Esau is on his way here to meet you. And by the way, he's bringing 400 people with him. And so now Jacob's like, "Uh uh-oh, maybe he hasn't forgiven me after 20 years. He's going to kill me. So Jacob gets scared, splits his camp, his family and his possessions into two camps, thinking that during the night, if Esau comes and attacks this half, the other half of my family can escape, right? So Jacob comes up with this plan that he's going to go across the river, and he's going to pray all night that God will deliver him from the hand of his brother, who's scheduled to show up tomorrow, by the way. So what happens? Let's go back in Genesis chapter 32. At some point during the night, a man shows up, and it's not just any man, it's the man, Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, in the physical form, shows up to Jacob, and what does he do to him? He picks a fight. Let's look at it. Let's look at the story. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So after years of being literally defined by his name, Jacob reaches this point of desperation in his life. Jacob's starting to think, maybe all that deception All that deceiving I've been doing wasn't such a good idea. I've got some wives now. I've got some kids. I've been pretty financially blessed, but all that's going to end tomorrow because my brother's going to show up and he's going to kill me. So Jacob is at this messy point in his life, and he thinks to himself, I'm just going to go across the river, and I'm going to spend the night in prayer asking God for what I think that I need, in hopes that if God will just answer this one prayer for me, then when that's all over and I'm alive tomorrow, then I can give up my deceptive lifestyle in my own power. I can say, you know what? Lesson learned. I'm just going to stop doing that to people. But Jesus had different plans for Jacob's life because Jesus knew that Jacob would never experience life change until he first experienced identity change, and that identity had to be rooted in him. So Jesus shows up on the scene, he confronts Jacob, he picks a fight with him, the Bible says he wrestles with him, and that's cool to me because like, I'm not really a football fan, like lots of people up here, the sports I like are baseball, and then pretty much anything that's like hand-to-hand combat, like boxing, UFC, even some WWE, I'm not going to lie, pay-per-view tonight. If anybody wants to invite me over, because my wife don't let me watch it at home. (laughs) But I like picture Jesus like showing up with like trash cans and ladders, you know, like we're going to have a match. Let's set the cage up. You and me, Jacob, we're about to go. So Jesus shows up. He confronts him. He picks a fight with him. He breaks him by dislocating his hip with a single touch, which how powerful is that, man? Like you're just wrestling in the boop. ah, Yes. But then look what he does. In verse 27, look what he says to him. He says, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Why is that a big deal? Why is that a big deal that he asked him what his name is? Because in that moment, Jesus is forcing Jacob to own who he's been and where he's been finding his identity. And the good news for Jacob, which is the good news for us, is that as soon as Jacob owns his sin... As soon as he owns his sin, what happens? Jesus does exactly what he's been praying for all night. He blesses him. 
in a way far different than he imagined, but he blesses him. He gives him a new identity, and Jacob experienced life change as a result. So you're starting to see a little bit how this story of Jacob can apply to us. You see, like I said earlier, every single one of us has had our identity stolen by sin. Every single one of us. And every single one of us, at some point in our life, is searching to find our identity and not really knowing where we're going to find it at. But there comes a point in our life where we must all stand face to face with Jesus Christ, be confronted by the gospel, and it's a confrontation because the gospel compares our sinfulness with his holiness. It compares our unrighteousness with his righteousness. It compares our imperfection with his perfection. And we have to be confronted by the gospel and decide if we're going to own our sin and by grace, through faith, receive the gift of eternal life and a new identity in Christ Jesus or if we're going to keep looking and searching to find our identity elsewhere. Every one of us has to make that decision. And the identity change is not rooted in ourselves. It's made possible because Jesus Christ is the true and greater Jacob. It was Jesus who wrestled all night in the Garden of Gethsemane and then took the decisive blow on our behalf so that we no longer receive what we deserve, but we only receive the wounds of his grace. And that grace, by that grace, we can receive a new identity and experience life change. Because life change begins with identity change. Romans 3.23 reminds us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news this morning, the good news that John gives us in John chapter 1, verse 12, look at this. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Talk about an identity change. You go from being a ragamuffin to a child of God. You see, Jacob, Jesus didn't wait for Jacob to get his act cleaned up. He didn't wait for him to get his life together. Jesus goes and he meets Jacob at the messiest point of his life. And I'm here to tell you today that he will meet you there also. He will meet you there also. I know that if there's anyone here who has not experienced that, today can be the day. If you're here and you're thinking, bro, you don't know, guess what? I do know, because I've been there too. You can experience life change today. And there's still, there's some of us here who are believers, who have given our lives to Christ. But we're still, we're still trying to to find our identity in something other than him. You haven't reached out and claimed the identity that he offers. And what I mean is that some of us are probably still finding our identity in our fear. You're a Christian, but you're paralyzed with fear. And it controls your life. Or shame. Or hurt or past sin, or some other form of condemnation that's not even yours anymore in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if we go a little bit further in verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. If you are in Christ, you are no longer defined by your marriage, your job, your children, your shame, your past sin, or anything else than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When you stand before God, when you stand before God in Christ, he doesn't look at you and just simply say, you're forgiven which I can kind of understand. 
I can kind of wrap my mind around forgiveness. You, you, you let it go. You don't hold it against somebody. But when we stand before God, covered by the blood of Christ, he doesn't just look at you and say, you're forgiven. He says, you're righteous. You're not guilty. Mind blown. I cannot wrap my mind around the fact that when God looks at me, me, Stephen Bailey, the sinner that I am, he looks at me and says, you are righteous because you're covered in the blood of my son. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And so my question today, my question for us today is where are you finding your identity? Where are you finding your identity? If it's in anything other than Jesus Christ himself, today is the day for you to embrace the identity that's already yours in him. It's already yours. He offers it freely. All you have to do is receive it, believe it. And how do we do that? How do we do that? What does walking in my new identity look like? It looks like, and this is the best way that I could think to, to, to describe it, it looks like believing the promises of God over the promises of anything else. Believing the promises of God over the promises of anything else. You have to preach to yourself, not listen to yourself. Does that make sense? You have to preach to yourself, not listen to yourself. Some of you may be defined today by your loneliness. There may be some people here who really, really, really feel called to get married and you want to get married, but that just really hasn't panned out in your life and that loneliness that you experience defines your life. Stop listening to yourself. Preach to yourself. Find a promise in the scriptures and preach yourself out of that. It has to be rooted in the scriptures. Find a promise like, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Stop listening to yourself. Stop being defined by your loneliness and preach the word of God to yourself. Some of us may be defined by failure. The businessman who's tried three different times to start a business and every one of them's failed. And people say, that's the guy who can't run a business. And you start to believe it. And you start to let that failure define you. Find a promise that you can preach to yourself. I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. Philippians 4.13. And I'll be honest with you guys. The one that I struggle with, the one that I struggle with the most, is my past sin and my past decisions. Before I was a believer, I was not a good person. Like, I'm surprised that I have friends, <laughs> like, to this day. And that's one of those things that when I start to be defined by what I've done in the past, I can sink very quickly into, like, a depression. But I have to get up and remind myself and preach to myself every day that verse that I read earlier, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I have to preach that to myself. That's one for me. And that may be you too. And all of those seem like negative things, like just defined by failure or loneliness or past sin. But some people are finding their identity in things that aren't necessarily bad. Like how good of a parent you are. Children aren't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to be a parent. But how many of us are at that point where we just think, man, if I can just work a little bit harder, earn a little bit more money, make sure that the kids' clothes are washed and cleaned and folded, and my kids will look at me and say, you're doing a good job. And you're trying to find your identity in being a parent. Same thing applies. You've got to find a promise in the Word of God and preach that to yourself so that that does not identify you, that that does not shape your life. A good one, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, 
in whom there is no shadow of turning. Children are a gift from God, and we can't keep searching and finding our identity. And those are just some examples, but my question today is where are you finding your identity? Where are you finding yours? Today's the day that you can reach out and find your identity in Christ. Life change begins with identity change. And one of the ways that Jacob's life was changed after his encounter with Jesus was that he walked away limping. And I've read lots of books and listened to lots of sermons, and there's many theologians who believe that Jacob probably walked with a limp the rest of his life. And that's funny to me, not that he was crippled and he walked with a limp, it's funny to me because I have a relative who's an agnostic and it's been said to me multiple times, Christianity is just a crutch for those who can't make it on their own. And you know what I say to that? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm okay with that because I can't make it on my own. And neither can you. We need Christ Jesus to be our strength. When we walk in our own power, every time I've ever tried to do it, it's ended very badly for me. But when I walk in the power and the strength of Jesus Christ, I walk better than I ever have before. And so that's okay to walk with a limp. It's okay to admit, yeah, Christianity is a crutch for those of us who are willing to admit that we can't make it on our own. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Where are you finding your identity today? We're going to sing a few songs. And if you're here and you're out there and you're thinking, I've never put my trust in the Lord. I've been searching. I've been trying. I've been trying hard and I'm getting nowhere because I'm finding my identity in so many other things. I'm going to be standing right there. Matt Mansfield's right there. Chris Dubay's right here. Josh Burnett, all three elders, they're here. Steve Walters is up there. There's people here who will talk to you. Eric Hohengasser is offended because I left his name out. I see it on his face. He's here too. <laughs> Sorry, bud. You were kind of hiding. There's people who will talk to you today. We want to. And still, even if you're like, oh, I am a believer, but I haven't grasped onto that identity that's mine, we're here. We'll talk to you. It can happen today.